Uh, hello, this is uh, lecture number 21. We're going to be discussing brain development and some of the essential processes that are involved in brain development. And then that's ultimately going to culminate with an examination of a neurodevelopmental disorder, in this case, uh, autism. So let's uh, begin this discussion by talking about uh, some of the essential processes. Uh, that are uh, involved in brain development that neuroscientists have uh, identified. And um, the five um, um, processes are migration, proliferation, differentiation, myelination, synaptogenesis. And we're going to go over those uh, so that you understand uh, their meaning. But if you take a look at this diagram that you see right here, this shows the first trimester, the second trimester, and the third trimester um, of uh, fetal life. And it shows what's happening. You're getting uh, neural development here during the first trimester. Neurons are multiplying. And then they're starting to migrate. This is something that's uh, happening really throughout the second trimester um, of, uh, of fetal life. But then you're getting branching of neurons in the forming of synapses, uh, uh, what we call pruning or apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. Uh, and then you're getting uh, uh, synapses uh, that are reorganizing and then uh, myelination uh, that is occurring. So we're going to take a look at each one of these um, uh, and uh, present some of the basic principles as well as some of the experiments that have been done in this area that have helped us to identify those processes. So one of the real um, pioneers in this area is the researcher that you see here. His name is uh, Roger Sperry. And he really was the first one to identify what we call the chemical trail. And that is that uh, axons are traveling uh, during early uh, development uh, across the brain in, in order to form connections. Uh, and he believed that uh, the way in which this was happening was by way of a, a chemical uh, biochemical trail uh, that they were following. And he did some uh, research with newts um, that I'll have a, a graph that will show you that, uh, that, that research, uh, in which he believed that he was able to um, uh, identify this chemical uh, trail uh, that the axons uh, in the newt uh, would use in order to find the uh, appropriate target area. So, <clears throat> When you take a look at Sperry's work, one of the things that he talks about is that these growing uh, axons follow a gradient of chemicals. Uh, some of those chemicals uh, attract uh, axons and some of them actually repel them. Uh, so those um, uh, uh, chemicals or uh, neurochemicals, he believed, were crucial for this whole uh, process of, of migration that, that takes place. So if you take a look um, at this graph uh, that you see here, uh, this shows this wonderful research that he performs uh, in which, um, again, he's working with newts. Uh, and what he is doing uh, is he's cutting the optic nerve and he's inverting the eye. And the optic nerve is growing back. And here you can see this is an intact um, uh, 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 brain connections uh, that you see here. Uh, here's the retina of the eye and the uh, neuronal connections that are taking place with the brain. It's referred to as the tectum. Uh, and you can see where these uh, are going uh, and uh, where they uh, ultimately end up uh, in, the, in the brain of the newt. So what he is going to do is he's going to cut the optic nerve. And what he's going to do is he's going to uh, invert um, uh, the eye. Uh, and uh, what he's going to do is he's going to explore where uh, these connections end up going to uh, in the brain. And what he finds is that uh, they go back to their original targets. Uh, and he believed that uh, the way in which this was happening was by way of this, this chemical trail this chemical, uh, uh, chemical gradient. Instead of attaching randomly, they're going back uh, to where they uh, uh, initially were. So, so this is a you know, really important uh, uh, piece of research, that these axons are regrowing. They're attaching to the same target neurons uh, 
uh, as before, and he's really the first one to, to document this in his research. Um, if you take a look um, at uh, migration, again, it's these uh, newly formed neurons uh, that are going to their uh, eventual locations, and the migration that occurs uh, is occurring throughout uh, uh, the brain in a variety of different directions, and it's doing so by way of these chemical pathways. And we know more about these pathways now. They're what are called immunoglobulins and chemokines, mm -hmm. and they become very important in terms of directing those neurons to find these um, uh, uh, very specific target areas during this migration process. So brain development um, in terms of what we call proliferation, that's, that's new cells that are being formed, um, new neurons. And this is occurring during early life. Uh, a lot of it's occurring uh, in the cells lining the ventricles. Uh, here you see the ventricles down here. Uh, and um, uh, things like stem cells, for example, they are, they are dividing uh, and uh, again, finding uh, new locations. And um, uh, this is uh, obviously a very important process, this proliferation process that is this production of, of new cells uh, that's occurring. Um, if you take a look uh, at the process that we call differentiation, um, we have uh, the formation of the axon and the formation of uh, dendrites that's occurring. Uh, that genesis that occurs uh, occurs by way of what we call these neural uh, progenitors. Um, they're going to start to grow axons and dendrites, and then they're going to end up in, in these target cells uh, that you see here. Uh, so the axon uh, is first, first growing uh, during migration, uh, and once it's reached its target areas, that's when it begins to develop dendrites. So again, neurons uh, are dramatically different in terms of their shape and the chemical component, um, depending upon you know, where their location is uh, in the brain. So that's the, the process of differentiation. We also have myelination, and we talked about this a little bit when we were taking a look at um, uh, the structure uh, of the neuron uh, and the uh, axons and the action potential that travels down. Um, uh, those axons, that myelination that you see right here, you have these glial cells that are wrapping uh, around uh, the axon. It's a fatty sheath. Uh, it's covering the axons, um, and indeed, uh, this is helping to speed up neurotransmission. So myelination occurs initially in the spinal cord, then it goes to the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain, and that myelination really occurs uh, uh, usually, you know, for the first 30, 40, 50 years of, of, of life. Um, Synaptogenesis, that's the final stage uh, of this neural development and the formation, uh, the actual formation of synapses. It is something that occurs throughout life. Uh, you know, we're constantly producing new connections, discarding old ones. Uh, it's something that does slow down later on uh, uh, in, in life. Uh, and again, here's a, a model uh, for the synaptogenesis where you're getting this cell to cell adhesion that's taking place. Uh, and then the development of this uh, uh, scaffolding that you see here that ultimately will, will represent the, the postsynaptic area. So again, this is the final stage uh, of this, uh, uh, develop, this developmental uh, process that takes place. And again, we refer to it as synaptogenesis. Um, one interesting question here is, you know, whether or not new neurons are formed later in life. And, um, when you take a look at the history of this, one of the things that scientists initially concluded was that no neur neurons were being formed after early development. But there's a lot of research, more recent research now, that indicates that, that um, new neurons are formed uh, later on in life. A couple of examples, stem cells. Uh, these are undifferentiated cells. Uh, they generate what are called daughter cells, uh, and they can, in fact, transform into glia uh, or neurons. You know, you see a lot of uh, references to uh, the harvesting of these stem cells uh, because they are 
are ones that uh, can regenerate uh, and, put, and produce daughter cells. Uh, we also know, for example, uh, that in certain mammals uh, in the olfactory system, uh, olfactory receptors um, uh, are, are continuously uh, replacing dying ones. Uh, so this whole idea then that new neurons can't be formed later uh, on in life is uh, mythology. Uh, we now know that they can. Um, songbirds, uh, another uh, interesting example of this, uh, the development of new neurons occurs uh, in uh, the brain regions that are involved in, in singing behavior. Uh, that you get a steady replacement that occurs of, of new neurons uh, in the brains of uh, songbirds. Uh, so indeed, this is you know interesting research, which which now indicates that the the formation of these new neurons absolutely can occur later on in life. Uh, when you take a look at the formation and the elimination of connections that are taking place, you know some. Uh, postsynaptic cells are, are being strengthened uh, uh, in terms of their connections with other cells. Some are being eliminated. Um, a lot of this seems to, to be very much dependent upon the amount of these neurochemicals that they're exposed to. Uh, and if they are exposed to them, then it's going to strengthen um, um, these connections. Very interesting concept advanced by this researcher, Gerald Edelman, on the uh, idea of what we call neural Darwinism. And what we mean uh, by that is that there's co a competition that takes place uh, among synaptic connections. Uh, we form more connections than we actually need. Um, and uh, the ones that survive typically are the ones uh, uh, in which uh, these neurochemicals have been very active. Uh, and um, uh, these chemical trails have been very active. Those that uh, 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 fail uh, are ones uh, that can't sustain uh, these active uh, connections, and it's typically because they have not been exposed to as much of these neurochemicals that are important for migration. So these neurotropins then are crucial uh, as chemical trails. Uh, again, axons that aren't exposed to those neurotropins, uh, there may be connections that are being made. Um, they, they ultimately fall by the wayside and they undergo apoptosis, this pre-programmed cell death. Um, so when you take a look then at, the, at a healthy um, uh, nervous system uh, of, a, of a mature organism, uh, generally, they have no neurons that fail to make appropriate connections and that, that were not uh, exposed to these neurotropins. Um, brain organization generally uh, is, is, is relatively limited, um, but axons and dendrites do modify their structure and their connections, uh, and this is occurring um, over the course of the entire lifetime. Dendrites continually grow new spines. Um, this is uh, something that is uh, certainly well known. And it's the gain and loss of those spines that is really directing the extent to which uh, there's new information processing occurring. We're going to take a look at a lot of research in the area of learning and memory, for example, that indicates uh, that it's, uh, it, it's the gain uh, of these uh, uh, spines and the growth of these new spines that's crucial uh, for um, uh, information processing. Um, it changes in terms of the neuron. Uh, it's constantly changing its shape. Uh, if you take a look at this figure here, just in a one month period of time, uh, in this case, uh, about a two month period of time, um, some branches are, are becoming elongated, others are retracting, that is they're becoming smaller. The shape of the neuron is constantly in flux uh, during uh, um, adult. Um, there are experiential influences, of course, on brain development, the classic work uh, that you probably are already familiar with from a, a course in introductory psychology, the work of Diamond and Rosenzweig in which they exposed rats to different types of uh, environments, an, an enriched environment like uh, what you see here, uh, or a relatively impoverished environment. 
And what uh, Diamond and Rosenzweig find uh, in their research is that the enrichment uh, definitely has an impact uh, upon uh, the brain cell. Uh, again, you get this uh, elaboration that takes place, this increased branching uh, that takes place. Uh, and indeed, the expansion of those neurons um, is something that we also see in human beings, uh, for example, that uh, are engaged in more physical activity. Uh, you have brain cells uh, that are um, uh, dramatically changing uh, as a consequence of this. So again, when we take a look uh, at uh, research, lower animal research in particular, you know, the thickness of the cerebral cortex is something that declines during old age, but um, uh, if a person remains physically active, for example, that is something that can uh, be diminished. Uh, uh, so again, this lower animal research has really helped us a great deal in terms of understanding, you know, some of these fundamental changes, that uh, brain changes that may be related to the environment. Um, here's a very interesting example of uh, neural changes that are related to experience. Um, this is a neuron that is taken from uh, uh, the brain of a fish. Uh, fish that's been reared in isolation, uh, as you see right here, that is no social contacts. You get a lot less branching that occurs. Uh, in contrast to a fish that has been reared socially, uh, you get a lot more neuronal branching uh, that occurs. So experience, the message here then is experience can have dramatic effects. Um, neuron changes uh, with experience. There's some also some some other, you know, really interesting research that's been done with uh, individuals, uh, human beings, for example, that uh, have lost one of their senses, like a person who, for example, becomes blind. They show uh, enhanced ability to use other senses, like uh, their sense of smell, for example, or, or increased verbal skills. Um, many of you may. Uh, be aware of the movie from some years ago called The Scent of a Woman, uh, which uh, Al Pacino won uh, an Academy Award uh, for his performance. Uh, Al Pacino was blind, but he developed his sense of smell to uh, a very, very high uh, level uh, in this movie. So one of the things that we know occurs in a person that's blind is uh, ordinarily the visual cortex of the brain. We refer to that as the occipital lobe. Um, the, uh, what, what, what happens is, um, you know, it's not processing visual information anymore. It begins to adapt and change, and now it begins to process tactile information and verbal information and olfactory information. So this is something that's relatively common uh, uh, that occurs uh, when you've been deprived, for example, of, uh, of one of uh, your senses. Um, you know, practice and brain changes, another, you know, very interesting area of research. One of the things that we know is that if you practice something over and over and over again and you get uh, uh, better at it, uh, the brain is adapting. The brain um, uh, uh, is changing as a consequence of that practice. Uh, there are a lot of really interesting MRI studies that have been done, for example, with professional musicians. Uh, in which they show that their, their temporal lobe in the right hemisphere is 30% larger uh, than in a non-musician. Uh, take a look at um, uh, individuals, for example, that are professional keyboard players. Uh, they tend to have thicker gray matter uh, in the brain that is uh, involved in, in hand control and vision. Uh, so indeed, these are you know really interesting brain changes that take place as a consequence of, of practice. Uh, one of the things that we know is that um, whenever you are very uh, attentive to something, you're focused on something, you practice it a lot, that attention does something in terms of neurochemicals in the brain. Namely, it's changing dopamine uh, within the brain. You're getting a lot more release of dopamine. Dopamine is acting on many different areas within the brain, but uh, generally, uh, it's acting on the cortex uh, to uh, expand our ability to respond to uh, various types uh, of environmental stimuli. 
so again, this is uh, another you know interesting consequence of what happens uh, in terms of uh, uh, experience. I want to talk a little bit about autism. It is such an interesting area uh, of, uh, of the study of uh, neurodevelopmental uh, disorders in which we're learning a lot more than um, uh, than we ever thought possible. I mean, this is something that goes back to 1943. That's when it was first described. And, um, uh, you know, it's a developmental disorder, brain developmental disorder that <clears throat> is characterized by a number of different interesting uh, symptoms in terms of impairment, uh, social interaction, uh, impairment in terms of communication, um, you see all kinds of repetitive um, self-stimulation behaviors, and it's something that really begins um, uh, well before uh, three years of age. And you know, now we're able to detect these things beginning, uh, um, you know, about four, five, six months of age. It is something that occurs in about five out of ten thousand births. It occurs worldwide. Uh, there's a gender difference. You can see it a lot more in boys than you do in girls. And sadly, this was a disorder that was thought uh, when it was initially discovered, even on in, into the 1950s and early 1960s. It was thought to be due to poor parenting styles. It was thought to be due to the fact that uh, uh, parents uh, were not giving enough stimulation uh, to their child. And now we know that that simply is mythology. That's that's just not true. Um, it is a, a disorder in which increasingly we're finding that it's related to genetic predisposition. That genetic predisposition is having an impact upon the development of the brain. So um, there's lots of variation uh, in terms of autism symptoms. Um, it's, it's highly uh, variable in, in terms of those symptoms. Um, <clears throat> It can vary in terms of severity. It can vary in terms of, of when it actually begins. It can vary a great deal in terms of uh, comorbidities. So there's enormous variation. And <clears throat> one of the things that's come out recently uh, is that uh, this whole idea that there's each individual is so dramatically different um, from from uh, the other. Uh, it's almost like like snowflakes, and you know that with snowflakes, no two are, are really alike. Well, that's something that increasingly we're finding uh, in terms of autism. So um, this is a disorder uh, which has been renamed. Um, instead of just calling it autism, we now refer to it as autisms and uh, <coughs> uh, spectrum uh, disorder. If you uh, take a look uh, at what happens in a lot of uh, autistic children, it's very characteristic of them um, to have uh, impaired language abilities. They typically talk later than uh, normal children. Um, they, uh, even though they've acquired at one time, the ability to say words or sentences is something that they oftentimes lose as they get older. Um, they don't like to make eye contact uh, when they um, are talking with someone. A lot of times they speak in abnormal tones. They use almost a sing-song kind of a voice. The, the speech seems to be very robotic. Uh, they can't start a conversation. They can't keep on going. They repeat words. Um, something that's called echolalia. And they don't really understand how to use words and the meaning uh, of, of words. It's very difficult for them to, to acquire those kinds of abilities. Um, <clears throat> a lot of social skill impairment in autistic children. They don't respond to their name. Very poor eye contact. Um, oftentimes, they appear like they don't hear someone uh, when they're uh, when someone is trying to get their attention. They don't like to be held. They don't like to be uh, cuddled uh, at all. Um, they are oftentimes unaware of the feelings of other individuals. They really kind of retreat uh, into their own world 
uh, and they prefer uh, to play alone as, a, as opposed to playing with others. Uh, if you take a look at uh, other uh, symptoms, they show these repetitive movements. Uh, hand flapping is a very common one. Um, they have these very specific routines and rituals that they engage in. They are easy uh, to disturb um, uh, at the slightest change that takes place in a, in a pattern or a ritual that they, they engage in. They're moving around constantly. Um, they're fascinated by certain objects, especially ones that are moving, like a spinning wheel, for example, on a, on a toy car. Very, very sensitive to environmental changes in, in terms of light and sound and touch. Um, yet um, they don't really respond to painful uh, uh, stimuli in, uh, in the same way in which a normal child uh, would. Uh, this is an interesting uh, book that was written a few years back by the uh, celebrity um, Jenny McCarthy, and it's called Louder Than Words. And it's really her own personal journey in terms of her um, autistic child. And some of that book really led to what is now referred to as the anti-vaccine movement, which is something that is... Uh, certainly present here in the United States, but uh, in, in other countries as well, in which individuals have openly uh, rejected the use of, of vaccines because they believe that it actually causes um, autism. So a little bit of history here, I think, uh, is important. Uh, back in um, uh, 1998, uh, a British scientist by the name of Andrew Wakefield believe that uh, he found that um, certain types of immunizations uh, would produce increased autism. I have to understand a little bit about vaccines here and immunizations. Uh, vaccines use what are called adjuvants. Uh, that is, the vaccine is actually put into this vehicle that uh, ordinarily helps um, that vaccine to become more effective. Uh, the claim that he was making was that certain of these adjuvants um, would actually increase the immune response to uh, the vaccine uh, and make it less effective. Uh, and he published a paper on this um, again in, in 1998 in a very reputable um, uh, journal, uh, which is called The Lancet. Um, and um, uh, come to find out, um, uh, the information in this journal article was very misleading. There were a lot of false statements that were made. Uh, the paper linking the vaccine to autism, um, he had many undeclared conflicts of interest, not the least of which was uh, investments in a pharmaceutical company that was making different adjuvants than, than were being used. And indeed, the recommendation that he was making in his paper is that these other adjuvants should be used instead of the ones that historically had been used uh, for the measles vac vaccine. Come to find out, he also manipulated um, uh, and falsely reported um, certain evidence uh, in, in his paper. The paper in 2010 was retracted. And here actually is a picture of that retraction. Um, the Lancet um, uh, retracted the paper, believing that it was uh, misleading and, and uh, uh, was uh, falsely uh, reporting. Uh, this uh, occasionally happens. Um, this article, um, however, uh, the, the article in 1998 that he published had a, a very profound effect. Uh, because many parents stopped in, uh, immunizing their children. Uh, and indeed, uh, things like measles and the mumps, for example, can be life-threatening. Uh, and um, uh, as a consequence uh, of this, there was a tenfold increase in the incidence of measles. So um, this, uh, you know, uh, lying uh, that occurs uh, can occur, certainly in science, it occurs occasionally. Uh, and this is a, certainly a case that it did, but the uh, effects of it uh, were profound uh, in, in terms of uh, the health of uh, children. 
so indeed um, uh, I wanted to make you you know aware uh, of this uh, and um, uh, hopefully it'll cause you to to think uh, about the the nature of science uh, that indeed uh, we do have these uh, occasions that uh, that uh, intentionally uh, uh, intentionally report false information uh, and uh, you know we have to be aware uh, of it and we have to have better safeguards to prevent these kinds of things from happening so here's what we know now uh, in terms of the brain areas that are uh, uh, implicated uh, in in autism um, it is related to abnormal brain development, and there's uh, two areas here that I in particular want to call your attention to. The amygdala, which is very important for, uh, you know, how we process um, uh, emotions. Uh, and the hippocampus that you see right here, which is involved in learning uh, and memory. One of the things that we know is that uh, in those uh, brain cells, um, in in these two areas, um, the cells are smaller, they're more densely packed in certain areas in um, an autistic child. Uh, and in other cases, um, they have uh, shorter and less developed uh, branches. So again, we have these you know, biological changes that have been associated with uh, autism. Uh, and the uh, science is really uh, progressing uh, much more rapidly in this area now in terms of helping us to understand uh, this disorder. So what actually goes wrong in the brain of an autistic child? I want you to take a look at this brain slice. This shows a normal hemisphere that you see right here. And here's one from an autistic child. So let's take a look at our normal hemisphere. This is the ventricles that you see right here. And we have these uh, germ cells um, during development that are um, uh, migrating uh, from uh, uh, the ventricles um, uh, through the white matter. And then ultimately, uh, they're going to the cerebral cortex, as you see here. This is normal development that occurs. But when you take a look at an autistic child, you know, many researchers now are finding that um, you're getting abnormal uh, development that is, occur that is occurring. Um, and again, uh, if you take a look uh, at the uh, autistic child uh, on the right here, a lot of these neurons are never getting to the surface. Uh, as you can see here, again, here's normal development and this normal migration that is occurring. I'm going to take a look at an autistic child now, and you're seeing that a lot of times they're not getting to where they are supposed to be. So again, you get these biological kinds of deficits that are occurring in autistic uh, children. There's evidence that is growing that there's genetic involvement. Autism does tend to run in families. Um, with, uh, if you have one autistic child, the risk of, of having another one jumps to about two to six percent. Um, but this information also suggests that we're not talking about a single gene here. Uh, we're probably talking about hundreds of, of different genes that are involved. Um, you know, if it was a single gene, then uh, that risk factor should jump uh, even much higher to 25 to 50 percent instead of 2 to 6 percent. With two autistic children, the risk for the third child jumps to about 35 percent. Again, this is suggestive of the fact that there has to be multiple genes that are involved. The concordance research that has been done with twins, which is so important in the field of behavioral neuroscience. Again, when one member of an identical twin pair is diagnosed with autism, what's the likelihood that the other one will be too? Uh, and what does this look like in monozygotic and dizygotic twins? Uh, some interesting work in the United States indicating that there's about a three or four fold um, uh, increase uh, that occurs uh, in terms of uh, uh, concordance rates in monozygotics in compared, uh, when compared to dizygotics. Um, in Norway, it's even higher 
uh, about 91%. And some of this, I think, is related to, related to a sampling problem in that uh, the not as many um, uh, identical twin and um, uh, fraternal twin pairs used in the in this study. But this <clears throat> this concordance work would suggest. Uh, that uh, there is a, an underlying genetic predisposition to this particular disorder. There's a research, um, piece of research, fairly recently done by uh, a scientist at MIT by the name of Rudy Tanzi. And um, I believe there's a, a videotape that you were um, that you watched uh, for this, but he, he has identified what he calls a mystery gene that's uh, adjacent to the SEMA5 gene. Here's the SEMA5 gene on chromosome uh, five. And <clears throat> this gene ordinarily uh, is involved in um, uh, how neural cells connect with one another during development. Um, and this mystery gene uh, that you see um, is, um, uh, we see in about 10% of autistic children, and that's suggestive uh, of there being an underlying genetic uh, a problem uh, that occurs uh, in um, uh, some uh, autistic children. So when we take a look um, at the sources of genetic mutation in autism, uh, it does account for some degree of the variation that you see in terms of autism. Uh, researchers believe that there's probably about 5,000 at risk, uh, 5,000 risk genes. Um, and those genes uh, may be impacting a variety of different biochemical processes, for example. Um, so again, when you take a look at uh, Mendelian disorders and other mutations, rare and de novo mutations, chromosome abnormalities, um, you know, what we're really talking about here is somewhere in the neighborhood, uh, probably of about 20, 20 to 25% of um, uh, autism is related to these, you know, genetic uh, uh, kind of um, uh, 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 mutations uh, in Mendelian disorders uh, and chromosomal abnormalities. So again, that's important research, uh, but um, what it's also just suggesting is that there are other things. It's not just genes. Um, and, you know, we have to be very cautious in terms of uh, not overplaying or overemphasizing the role that a genetic predisposition can play. Um, here's a very interesting animal model uh, for autism. Uh, you take a look at this chamber that you see here. Uh, it actually consists of three chambers, a middle chamber, and this left chamber that you see here where there's a, a mouse that's been placed inside of this uh, cage that you see, and there's no mouse placed inside a cage here. Uh, we take another mouse and place it in the middle of this cage, and we allow them to go in to here uh, to see this uh, other uh, mouse or to go in here where there is uh, no other mouse. So the question becomes, how much time do they spend here and how much time do they spend here? Autism is characterized by deficits in terms of social communication and social interaction. So the question becomes, you know, how much time will the, the mouse want to spend with another mouse? Uh, or will they instead want to spend time in this empty chamber uh, because there's nothing here? Well, it's very interesting, this one type of mouse, which is called the black and tan mouse, uh, BTBR mouse, they show deficits in terms of social communication. They don't want to be with a mouse. Uh, they don't want to socially interact with, uh, other with other mice. So they tend to avoid going into that chamber where that uh, that mouse um, has been placed uh, in in that cage, as they tend to avoid it. Well, one of the things that we know about the black and tan mouse is that they have some very interesting biological deficits. Their corpus callosum is absent. That is the uh, neural pathway that connects the two hemispheres of the brain. They tend to have a smaller hippocampus. 
uh, and they have a lot more unmyelinated axons than a normal mouse does. So this is being used now as an animal model for studying um, autism. So here are some of our conclusions then regarding autism. Um, you know, certainly genetic research is helping us to, to understand um, the, uh, um, the underpinnings, you know, the biological underpinnings of this disorder. Um, and um, that research may help us to develop new treatments. Uh, it may even help us in the area of uh, uh, prevention uh, at some point. Um, and um, we have to get out of this thinking, though, that uh, all types of autism have a genetic component uh, and that the environment plays no role. Uh, we're not there yet in terms of making that kind of uh, conclusion. Um, so again, fascinating area of study, uh, learning about uh, neurodevelopment and applying it to the case of neurodevelopmental disorders like um, autism. So that concludes this uh, particular lecture.